Cool. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk about EPPF. Uh, this is quite a technical talk for this early in the morning, so I hope everyone's had some coffee. Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is James. I am a senior solutions architect at iSurveillance. Uh, I've done some stuff. <laughs> I've done some stuff in the community. In the Kubernetes community, I'm a former release lead back for 124. Um, I've spoken at a bunch of different conferences, but this is my first time at Regex. So hello everyone. Um, and when I'm not digging around in kernel code and compilers, I play weird board games. So that's what I do. Um, oh, you're not. There we go. Right. Uh, there is some sample code. Um, you can get it on a GitHub link here. It's also both the slides and the sample code GitHub repository are also linked uh, in the schedule as well, if you want to take a look at that. So, ooh, ooh, okay, this is, okay, we might have to go back to just hitting, hitting mashing spacebar, but that's okay, we can do that. Right, so this talk is fundamentally because most talks about eBPF that I've seen have a slide that looks something like this, where we say that we load some eBPF program and then we attach it to a syscall and some magic happens, and that's great. So this talk is about that specific part, like what actually happens with that loading, what does that do, and what does that look like. Um, I have a little bit of assumed knowledge. You don't need to know in depth. Like, as long as you know what a syscall is vaguely, that's fine. I'm not expecting anyone to be able to explain to me kernel internals or anything like that, so don't, don't worry. You'll, you will be okay. Um, the other big thing about this talk is I'm not using any eBPF libraries. So there are a ton of libraries out there, libBPF, uh, the Golang one that I forgot my name, I think it's just GoBPF and various other ones, really help you do things. I'm not using any of them because the point is learning. But if you want to do this for real and really write an, e write an eBPF program, please use a library because otherwise you'll have to do what I did and it'll be awful. Um, so, right, quick overview just so you know what I'm going to do. We're going to introduce some sample code. We are going to compile it down into eBPF bytecode. We're going to talk about the bytecode a little bit. Then we're going to write a simple user line component, simple, that loads it into the kernel and attaches it to a trace point so that we can get some, some debug output out. So like the simplest eBPF example you can imagine. And we're going to go through what, what's happening at each stage. So let's start with an eBPF example. Here's some eBPF code. I'm going to step through this line by line. First of all, we'll talk about that later. That's complicated. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Next, we're going to do some imports. We're just going to get some helper functions. So there's two that we're using here. Um, we're going to grab those with some imports. We're going to make a function. Then we're going to call this helper function, which is going to go get us the, ultimately the PID in the kernel terms. It's actually called a thread group ID. So we need to get the TG ID. It's weird naming. That's what it is. So we're going to get the PID. Then we are going to call this BPF print K thing. And this is actually a macro. So here's the first lovely aside about compilers. Um, this is written in C, sort of. And most people's perception of a compiler, at least at the basic level, is you plug source code in one end and get kind of a binary out the other end. But with C, at least, oh my god, OK, no, this was a mistake. Um, with C, at least, we have a preprocessor in the middle. There is something that goes and will modify the source code before we actually compile it. And that's where these macros are expanded. So that BPF print K actually looks like this. We're actually calling a function called BPF trace print K. And then we're assigning the string we gave it into a constant and setting it at size as well. This is only relevant in the sense that if you want to look at the documentation for what this helper function does, it's not called what you think it's called because it's actually called BPF trace print K. So that's something to look out for. Oh, and yeah, technically all those includes and defines and stuff are done in um, preprocessing as well, but it doesn't matter. Right, so what this function actually does is it will output debug information to a particular file in syskernel so we can see it later. This isn't something you do in a real program, but it's used in a lot of debug examples. And then finally, we're just gonna return zero. So that, that's it, that's the BPF code, pretty simple. So we're gonna start by compiling it. Compile line in its most simple form looks like this. Uh, so I've annotated it so that Hopefully we can see what's going on, but the important parts are we're executing Clang, our compiler in this case. We're telling it we want some eBPF. We're giving it our input file, tracebpf.c. We're giving it our output file, which is the same with .o. And we're telling it where our includes are, and we're giving it a couple of other things as well. And what's important is that dash c, which gives it an object file rather than executable. We're not gonna talk about why that is, but this is how you compile in its most basic form some eBPF into some bytecode. 
So what's Clang, you might be asking? It, um, Clang is a C and C++ front end for LLVM, which is useful if you know what LLVM is. But if you don't, here's what Wikipedia has to say about LLVM. If this still doesn't help you, um, I think this diagram actually works really well. This is one, one of our blog posts a few years ago. Um, the idea with LLVM it is a compiler-like framework. So the idea is, instead of having to implement source code to uh, assembly every single time, you can just implement backends for the different architectures and front ends for the different languages. And importantly for us with LLVM, there is an eBPF backend. So we can just get eBPF bytecode out with, in theory, any language. I don't think anyone's actually tried to write eBPF from Fortran, but I'm sure someone will try. Um, so that means that our compiler stage actually looks like this now. So there's a whole bunch of like LLVM optimizations and IR that goes on here, and we get an object file at the back and, and various other things. And we're not going to talk about linkers. Those of you who know anything about compilers might be going, what about a linker? We're not going there. Right. The other question you have, if you've seen eBPF code, is what about these SEC, SEC macros you see all over the place? I don't have those in my sample code, but like real sample code and real code does have them. So what's that about? Um, this is just another macro. It ultimately tells the compiler which section, and we'll get to that, of the object file to put various things in. And this is used by real eBPF loaders, i.e. not my noddy one we're going to write in a moment, um, to pick up a bunch of information automatically. We're not going to do that, so we're going to have to do a bunch of heavy lifting ourselves. So in real eBPF code, you're going to want this. In our example, again, no library. We don't need it. So everyone with me so far? We've compiled some code. Right. Let's see what we got. Um, if we look at our object file, at least when I compiled it, you can see it is 792 bytes. Uh, and file will tell us it's an eBPF file. Great. What's in it? We can use a hex dump to actually see the data that's in there. And you can see when we render that as a string, we can see our string in there, because we had that string, that source syscall from PID percent D. That's in there, so that's a good sign. We have our string. We have a bunch of other stuff, but what, what does any of this mean? Um, we can use a function or a function, a program called read elf to get some information. Because remember, that file thing told us this is an elf format binary, which is just a, a binary format on Linux and various other systems. So if we use read elf, it'll tell us it has a number of sections. It, it has them with different names. The one we care about is the one named dot text. And if we get, get a hex dump of dot text, these are the eBPF bytecode instructions. Th these are the instructions. This is the thing we have actually compiled. And what's bytecode? Well, bytecode is like a fake machine language that is used by eBPF because it's compiled again later. Fake in the sense that the real hardware doesn't execute bytecode directly. There's another step that has to happen. Um, and we could just read the um, BPF documentation for the instruction set to understand what this looks like. So we can actually just read this ourselves if we wanted to. So for example, um, we know that a, a single instruction is 64 bits long with an optional extra 64 bits afterwards. So we can just find that out. So let's look at the first 64 bits. That's this in hexadecimal. And if we follow the spec, it tells us that there's an opcode, there's some source and destination registers, an offset, and an immediate value. So we can see what those are. So what does this instruction do? Well, the opcode is hex 85. The documentation tells us that the three least significant bits tell us what kind of instruction it is. In our case, with hex 85, that is a 64-bit jump instruction. And if you read the instructions for 64-bit jump instructions, it will tell you that the extra like one bit, the fifth bit, is where the source comes from, whether it's the register or the immediate value. And then the first four bits, the most significant bits, are a code that tell you what kind of jump it is. And I won't bring up that table, but for us, it translates to that um, uh, hex 8, translates to a call a helper function. And the of fifth bit being zero means that we're going to use the immediate value. So what this instruction means is, well, that immediate value, by the way, is 14 in this case, because I'm not going to talk about endedness in binary, but it's 14. So this means call EVBF helper num number 14. That's what this instruction does. Uh, you might wonder what 14 means. Well, you can look up a list of the helper functions and their associated IDs, and we can see that 14 is get current PID uh, TGID, which means this is to call that helper function, which makes sense, because that was the first thing that we did really in our source code. So this, this matches. This makes a lot of sense. So you don't have to do this by hand. You can use LLVM object to do this for you. This will decompile, decompile, 
the um, bytecode to tell you what it's doing, and you can see the first line there is call 14, which is, which is great. Um, if you're looking at this, the thing you might be wondering is what on earth is all this about? Why are we taking some random numbers and assigning them into register 10 minus various things? Like what, what's going on there? Well, if you look at the register information about eBPF, register 10 is a stack pointer. So when we're indexing backwards from it, we're pushing memory onto the stack. So we're loading something onto the stack when we do this from instructions. Why? Well, that's our string. So if you take a look at the values, and I appreciate most of you probably can't read ASCII kind of by heart, I can't. So if you go through and you decode it, that is our string. So that's where the string comes from in this case. Um, which leads me nicely onto, what about the thing I said I was gonna get back to? What about BPF no global data? Well, if you don't use it, what happens is the compiled binary, compiled object file, I should say, has an extra section called RO data. And if you look in RO data, well, there's our string again. And if you look at the instructions, the string isn't there. But we have a little warning from Redelf saying there's, there's relocations that haven't been applied. So what's that? What happened? Well, if you output the instructions, we can see that now instruction uh, ID number two there is just pushing zero onto the stack, which is a bit weird. So why is this happening? What's it doing? Well, if we look at the relocations, which is another section that got added, we can see there's a thing here with like an offset and a type of symbol value and some other information. So cut a long story short, you can ask it to apply the relocations for you, and it tells you here that there is like some data that needs to be pulled from RO data. So what this means is that if you compile eBPF like normally without this flag, then the constants are actually split out into a different part of the object file, and the thing that loads them into the kernel needs to create an eBPF map, and we don't have time to go into maps in detail, but creates a map, it will push all of the constants into this map, mark, mark the map as immutable, and then it will, tell, it will change the bytecode before it loads it to reference the map it needs to load from. Which means in most cases, the eBPF you're actually loading into the kernel is different from the eBPF you actually compiled, slightly. Which really blew my mind when I found out about that one. Um, so yeah, that's why I've got this in here, just to make my loader a bit simpler. So, we've compiled some code. That's what we actually got out. Let's actually load it into the kernel and do something useful with it. Um, again, a library would make this two lines, if that. Like, the, the, we're really doing this the hard way here. So don't do what I'm doing if you're really trying to do eBPF. So, we need to do three things. We need to get it into memory. We need to get it into the kernel, and then we need to tell the kernel to do something with it. First thing, uh, we're gonna write everything in C, just because it's, it's slightly easier, and it's easier to interact with raw syscalls this way. Um, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna open our object file. So I've hard-coded its name here. This is why a lot of EVF programs will let you specify the name of the object file. This is why. We're going to uh, call open, which is gonna get as a file descriptor. Aside, what's a file descriptor? Um, it's just a number. It's usually a very low number, like three or four, but is that process is mapping to a file or an open thing. Uh, this is relevant because it's gonna come up, come up quite a lot when dealing with EVPF is file descriptors. So we get a file descriptor to a file. Then we're going to use this function called elf begin in order to start reading our elf file. Um, you might wonder what on earth that is. This is from a utility called elf utils, which helps you reading an elf file. It's nothing to do with eBPF, actually. It's just for the elf file format. And it just it saves us having to like offset into the file to try to read it manually. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get the elf main header, um, and then we're gonna go through and parse it by sections, because remember that file had sections, and the main header tells us where they are. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna loop over every section. We're gonna get the a pointer to the section in memory. We're going to grab its header, and we're gonna pull its section name out as a string. Um, also, for those of you less familiar with C, you might be wondering what all this like char star is about. That's a char pointer. Um, C doesn't know what a string is, so instead we have pointers to chars, and a character is just a single byte, and if you want to come talk to me about Unicode and byte encoding, come find me later. Um, and most functions in C will operate on a char pointer until they hit a null byte, which is kind of a null terminated string, or they specifically take a length of a string, or they segfault or cause a security problem or something else. Um, so that's why it's a char star. 
And then we just compare it with .text, and if it's .text, we pull out the data. So what we're doing here is we're iterating through the sections. We find the one called .text, and we read its data into, into an ELF data pointer and do some error handling. So we have it into memory, nice and easy. Now we need to put it in the kernel. To do this, we use the BPF syscall. This is kind of the one syscall that does pretty much everything with eBPF is the BPF syscall. Um, we pass it in a command and a kind of block of attributes specific for that command. And the command that we want is bpf prog load. So obviously we load and verify a program into the kernel. Um, the structure we need to give it looks like this. This is from the bpf man page. Uh, we just tell it a, a few bits of information and we're going to step through this in a second. So we, we know what we need to give it. So let's do that. First thing we're going to do is we're going to give it a log buffer. So syscalls can usually only return an integer and if you want some feedback about why the verifier has told you it doesn't like your code, we're going to need more than that. So the way that we achieve this is that we take, we allocate some memory, 10 kilobytes in this, in this example, and we're going to give a pointer to that to the BPF syscall so that it can write a string output of how it verified things and how it loaded things and the error messages into that buffer so we can see it later. That's all we're doing. Next, we're going to talk about the license. Uh, licensing an eBPF is important because if your code is GPL, it can access or GPL compatible. It can access SERP and helper functions, and if it isn't, it can't. Uh, in this case, it's dual BSD GPL, so it's GPL compatible, so no problems. But you need to tell it what license it is. Um, next, we're going to give it the instructions. Um, you might be wondering what a BPF inst is. This is just a struct that maps kind of a single instruction into that structure we, we talked about before. And if you take the example of our first instruction from last time, um, you can see this is how we, we would index into it. So if you index it into it by bytes, you will just get the individual bytes. Where if you index it, into, index into it by instructions, you will get whole instructions at once, and then you can do like dot op, dot code, dot op, whatever, in order to get information. So it's just a useful way to be able to parse things. Um, so what we're doing here is passing in a pointer to the instructions in memory, and we're telling it how many instructions we think there are, which we do just by dividing by the size of an instruction. Uh, and then we're going to tell it it's a trace point program. Uh, then we're going to do the actual syscall. So we're going to call BPF. It's the syscall thing up here. Um, there's no like wrapper function in glibc for B the BPF syscall, like there is for open and things like this, so we have to call it manually, not a problem. Uh, we're going to tell it it's prog load, and we're going to give it our attributes, and then we're going to do a bunch of error handling, which is what the, you know, we're going to wrap up the log, we're going to handle errors if they happen, and give the FD, because this will give us back the file descriptor to the BPF program if it's successful. Great. We've loaded it into the kernel. What did that do? So this is where we go into kernel source code. Um, as a note, I did all of my research for this on the 6.1 kernel from Debian 12, so there might be slight variations, but broadly speaking, this is how it works. The BPF syscall does a whole bunch of stuff. It's going to do some permissions checking. It's going to make sure that you have those capabilities, you know, those ones that you set all on on your containers. Um, this is the one that will check that you have that. Um, there's some edge case checking for some stuff I'd never thought about, as if like you're using different kernel versions with different versions of attributes. Um, then we're going to copy the attributes into kernel memory, and then we're going to ask the security subsystem. So if you're using AppArm or SE Linux, this is where that check happens in the kernel to make sure you're allowed to make this call. Um, then there's a massive switch statement, which just switches on all the different things a BPF um, call can do. And this one is ours, the BPF prog load. And if you follow that down, I'm not going to copy out this entire function because it's extremely long and does a lot of stuff, but some interesting things it does do um, is license checking. This is where it decides whether or not your license string is GPL compatible or not. Um, it's going to allocate some kernel memory for your BPF bytecode, and then it's going to ask security about this again once it's done that. And then it's actually going to copy everything over. This means that if you load an eBPF program and then change it in your program's memory, it doesn't matter because it's been copied over into the kernel. Um, we're going to specify the JIT hasn't happened yet, which we'll touch on in just a second, and various other things like that. Um, and then Three very important things. We're going to run the verifier, we're going to run the compiler, and then we're going to allocate a file descriptor. The verifier, I really do not have time to go into like full detail on it. It's an entire like talk by itself. But in short, it will just exhaustively check statically that your eBPF code isn't going to get into an infinite loop or isn't going to access memory it's not allowed to. 
all the things that would cause your kernel to misbehave and the whole reason why EPPF is better than writing a kernel module. Um, once we've done that, we're going to actually run the, the just-in-time compiler down to the machine code of the thing you're running on. So this is a platform-specific thing, necessarily. Um, it ultimately calls BPF into JIT compile. And if you follow this down, here's the x86 six example, just to give you a taste of how this works. You can see, ultimately, we are just doing a switch statement on EBPF opcodes and emitting x86 opcodes that look equivalent. So you can kind of follow this down. So this is a kind of a bad way of doing this, I've been told by many of my colleagues. But you can turn on a debug flag in your kernel to make it emit to the kernel log the JIT kind of um, compiled bytecode when you, it compiles anything. So if you set this on, then you, you load some eBPF. I got this out as my output. And there is a, a helper program called uh, BPF JIT disam, which will disassi disassemble this so you can read it. So this is, in my case, x86.64, because that was my test environment, um, uh, assembly code equivalent to our BPF code. And we, again, we don't have time to go into like x86.64 opcodes, but you can see the general thing. We're calling a function, which is probably going to be the helper, the first helper function. We're loading the string in a very similar way, and we're calling the helper function. So it's ultimately a very similar structure, just expressed in the way that the actual processor in this machine will be able to run it. Um, by the way, you can use a BPF tool to do this a lot easier, rather than having to do this like janky debug method. But there's a good way of doing this. So. That's what that does. So all of that happens when you've loaded the program. We haven't even attached it to anything yet. Now we need to actually attach it, which is the last step. Um, we're going to put it on a trace point in our case. Um, the BPF man page will helpfully tell you that the method of attachment is entirely dependent on what you're attaching it to. In the example of a trace point, we need to get a reference to it. We need to get a file descriptor to it first. The way we do that is we are going to read this file um, which is in syskernel debug tracing events syscalls, sysenter xceev, which is the syscall we want to enter on. That's the trace point we want, ID. And in this file is the string representation of its ID, which is what we need. So all we're going to do is we're going to open it, and we're going to read it in, and then we're going to use uh, A2I in order to parse it as a string into an integer. So relatively standard stuff here. Um, then we're going to make another syscall called perf event open. And this is the one which will actually create the trace point. So we're going to give it the trace point ID we want. We're going to tell it that we want a perf type trace point. And this will give us back a file descriptor to that trace point that we've created. Um, the perf subsystem in Linux is an entire system by itself that more or less only coincidentally does EPPF. It does a whole bunch of other performance monitoring stuff, which again, we can't go into. Um, but the important thing is that it gives us back this file descriptor, and then you can use that with either IOCTL or PRCTL, which is good, because we're using IOCTL. So this is our final syscall. We're going to do IOCTL. We're going to ask, uh, give it the trace point ID. We're going to sell it perf event IOC set BPF, which assign a BPF program to this trace point, And we're going to give it the FD to our BPF program we got from the BPF syscall. But what does that do? Well, if you follow this down, um, we are going to ultimately call perf event set BPF prog. That is going to then ultimately call perf event attach BPF prog. And to cut a very long story short, effectively, this adds a reference to that EPPF program in the kernel to the trace point. And the way syscalls are executed is platform specific. But that platform specific method, if a trace point exists for a particular syscall, will be modified. So it will ultimately call into the tracing subsystem, and then that will invoke the EPF call before it actually executes the SIS call. So there we go. We've attached the trace point, which means, at long last, we can compile our code. We can compile our EPF code. We can compile our loader. We can run it as sudo, of course. We can get a bunch of output. And then in a separate terminal, we can get our tracing output, which can tell us it's all SIS call. And that's it. <laughs> And I have a bunch of references and special thanks and those sort of things. <laughs> <laughs>
at some point you said something that I found super uh, exciting about how eBPF was safer than writing kernel code and just that uh, sprung this question, are there parts of the kernel that would make sense to be rewritten in eBPF uh, or is that just silly talk? Um, I mean, I'm not a kernel like core developer, so I, can't, I don't really know what the attitude to this is. The main, one, one of the big justifications for eBPF was that if you write, if you want to extend its existing functionality, your choice is boiled down to getting a patch exception to the kernel, which took a long time, you had to wait for it to be percolated into main distributions, or write a kernel module, and those are, you can quite easily crash things if you do that, and trying to compile them, you had to do it for a specific kernel, and it was just complicated. So eBPF was designed as an easy, pluggable way to get new features into the kernel without having to go through all that. Whether or not we should go down the route of rewriting stuff, I, I don't know. Um, it's certainly a very fast way to get stuff in. So. Hello, uh, I would like very much to appreciate the navigation, which language you are talking about in the upper right corner. This was very helpful for me because I was confused <laughs> in a few slides. And But I was wanted to ask about um, very high level question if do if we do have a bytecode uh, that is ebpf how can we validate if the kernel version is supported this is at the when it is inserted through the validator to kernel this is the step that would break at this point if the code is not valid for my particular version of kernel or when when is or is there a tool to do it um so the, the way I compiled it there was specific for my kernel. I gave it my kernel headers. Um, there is a whole body of work, which is like CO-RE, which is around compiling kind of generic eBPF bytecode for a kernel. That is way beyond the scope of what we can go into here. But um, it, it's something that's definitely been worked on. It's something that is possible, just not in this very simple way that I've written it. Okay, so the way you showed means that this is just for the specific kernel yeah. version. Oh, okay. Thank yeah, this is, this is the dumbest way possible, which means that it is yeah. specific to a kernel It's pretty cool, to be honest. But if I would uh, try to run this on a different kernel, in the validator step, when I would insert the, try to insert the code into the kernel, that would break? Is that the point? Or would if, it's, if it's been compiled on, for a different kernel. So if you compiled it again for your kernel, okay. then it would work. If you compiled it for a different kernel, like the... Um, it's part of the stable um, Linux kernel API are those like functions that we call the helper functions. So this particular eBPF program is relatively portable. You just need to compile it every time. If you're going against like extra kernel functions or you're doing K probes or things like that, those aren't as guaranteed to be to be stable between kernel versions. Okay. Anybody else? Time for one more. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I've seen that you had, like, with the licensing stuff, this was, like, kind of uh, necessary to uh, get that running. Is that correct? Uh, I think in my example, the um, functions I was running weren't GPL required, actually. So I probably could have done mine without GPL, I think. But there are a lot of very useful... You need to... Oh, okay. There you go. Okay. Liz would know. Yeah, no, I needed... Yeah, I needed it. Um, and the extra question was, like... Um, I, how do you take care of the exception handling? Is that the part where you said, okay, the verifier takes um, over um, on that? Or how you make sure that the uh, kernel is not compromised by the code um, you're uh, writing there? Why, if I try to load code of the wrong license? Yeah. Or, or um, anything else, or even with a... Uh, with a I believe the verifier, verifier checks. I okay. Think. I think it's the verifier that will, will make sure that you don't call the GPL-only helper function if your code is not GPL compatible. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, James. Really fantastic. <laughs>